We are back, and you're listening to The Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. RT has a piece by Fyodor Lukyanov. Russia's role in the global economic order has turned out to be more significant than the West believed. Western sanctions against Russia are speeding up the end of globalization as we've known it. A new economic order awaits. Has the U.S. overplayed its hand and is the U.S. being outmaneuvered on the global geopolitical landscape? For insight into this, let's turn to our next guest. He holds the John J. and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book has just come out. It's entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So let me let me get you to weigh in on the two questions that I just uh, posed based upon uh, the analysis in this piece. Has the U.S. at this point overplayed its hand and is the U.S. being outmaneuvered on the uh, geopolitical on the global landscape? Well, I think the answers are obvious. That is to say that. Washington, U.S. imperialism has committed the fundamental flagrant error of grand strategy, which is underestimating your adversary. And you see this reflected in the off-cited quotation from the late Senator John McCain that Russia is a gas station masquerading as a nation. You see that in the other off-cited quotation that you read in the corporate media on a regular basis which is that Russia is upper volta with missiles, supposedly comparing Russia to a African nation that no longer exists is considered to be the ultimate insult. And I think that this underestimation has led to the present global crisis, particularly with regard to fuel and energy. Washington knew going in that uh, Russia was a major petroleum producer If Washington had paid attention to the banter between Saudi de facto leader Mohammed bin Salman and President Putin at the G20 meeting in Buenos Aires a few years ago, they could have inferred easily that Saudi, the number one producer in Russia, or Saudi, the number two producer in Russia, presumably the number three producer, uh, were in very uh, good, uh, had a very good relationship and that it would be difficult, as Mr. Biden is now finding out, to get Saudi to break its ties to Moscow and pump more oil so that the price of gasoline at the pump in the United States uh, will not ascend to $10, $11, $12 a gallon. And we all know that with regard to the price of food, you have to factor in fuel because food is oftentimes transported And therefore, there is this knock-on effect, which has led to inflation that you see in the supermarket, which means it's obvious to any U.S. consumer who shops. And Washington also has miscalculated because if, as is happening now, the so-called Western European allies that turn away from Russian natural resources, they'll have to turn to African national natural resources – But that's, in a sense, going from the frying pan to the fire, because we all know that with regard to Africa, Africa has positive relations with Russia, positive relations with China, positive relations with Turkey, positive relations with India. There's a lot of competition there. And there's also a lot of residual animosity uh, towards Europe and towards North America, given the centuries-long plunder of the African continent. Uh, by North America and by Western Europe, uh, which you see reflected today as we speak with the trip to the Democratic Republic of the Congo by the Belgium king, who was returning thousands of stolen and plundered artifacts uh, from this territory, this sprawling territory, which in some measures is larger than Western Europe geographically. But between 1885 and about 1908, was not necessarily a colony of Belgium, but a private uh, 
preserver of the monarch of that time, King Leopold. And so that led to the deaths of untold millions, the maiming of many millions more. And so by trying to reorient the Euro- European and economy in particular towards Africa, uh, that does not necessarily make sense, particularly if you look at the congruence between Russia and, say, Germany, where you can have pipelines going directly from Russia into Germany, uh, or you can have ships uh, sailing into Hamburg, the major German port, a hop, skip, and a jump from Russia. Uh, there is hardly any kind of geographic compatibility when you turn to Africa, as Chancellor Schultz of Berlin must have known when he traveled last week to Senegal, Niger, and South Africa. And so Washington and its allies have found themselves in a pickle, and it's unclear how they're going to find their way out of this dilemma. You know, when we uh, uh, the, when we, we talk about the, uh, the, the the economics here, we hear this now, this silly trope about they want to provide an off ramp for Putin so that he won't be humiliated as though this is about uh, Vladimir Putin's, uh, uh, you know, mental state as opposed to, you know, actual geopolitics. But it appears to me that it is the Europeans and the Americans that need an economic off-ramp. We actually reported on an article here a few days ago where the authorities in Poland have now authorized people to literally forage for firewood to heat their homes because they've stopped coal and gas coming from Russia. So it seems to me this whole idea of an of an off ramp for the Russians or for Putin because they need to get out of this, you know, emotionally unscathed and underlying that the reality is some kind of projection where they're saying, how do you let us out of this? Because this economy is going to destroy us. We're going to have social unrest and our whole society is going to fall apart. What do you think, Dr. Horn? Well, look at the future prices with regard to natural gas, so the prices of natural gas futures, I should say more accurately, if those futures prices hold by November, there's going to be a major crisis in Western Europe, but Britain included, as you have the possibility of many Western European nationals either being in the dark or being cold in the dark, and that is not a prescription for tranquility, domestic tranquility. And factor in, with regard to your point concerning uh, humiliation, that by the admission of Mr. Zelensky himself, uh, Russia controls about 20% of Ukrainian territory with uh, Ukraine on a slope to continue to absorb an unsustainable number of casualties, that is to say deaths and maiming injuries of their troops. But even with that gloomy scenario, it it reminds me of the uh, fictional French general who says, my left flank is collapsing, my right flank is retreating, situation excellent, I attack. What I mean is that in the midst of this gloomy prognosis, which has a basis in material reality, Washington and its acolytes are already plotting for what they call the breakup of Russia itself. That's the latest hot item in the mainstream press. Uh, That is to say, they're arguing that there needs to be a, quote, decolonization, unquote, of what they call, quote, the Russian empire, unquote. Now, what's interesting about that is that uh, I'm no seer, I'm no oracle, My crystal ball has been in mothballs for years now, but I think I can well and easily predict that at some point, even given the gloomy scenarios that we both have sketched, I expect enormous pressure to be placed upon the Russian city of Kaliningrad. Now, look at your map, and you'll see that Kaliningrad abuts both Poland and Lithuania. Uh, It's a session from defeated Germany in 1945. In many ways, it's separated uh, from what you might call the Russian mainland, just like Hawaii and Alaska are separated from what might be called the the lower 48 or the continental North American states uh, from Washington 
to form on the northeast coast. And so they're already plotting to put pressure on Russia. And that's what we we need to be reminded, is that the imperialists, uh, one of the things uh, I will take my hat off to them about is that uh, even as they're going slowly down to defeat, uh, they're plotting their comeback, uh, which suggests that those who are interested and concerned about defeating imperialism likewise have to be perpetually vigilant and perpetually on guard. So when I look at Kaliningrad, uh, to your point, borders uh, Lithuania and Poland, uh, and I guess that's the that's the Black Sea th- that it abuts. When you say they're going to put pressure on Kaliningrad, what type of pressure do you anticipate th- th- that they that they apply? Well, uh, well, I think it's the Baltic Sea too, by the way. Oh yeah, I'm but sorry. Yes, it is. Sea. No, it is, yeah, it is. Thank you. It is the it is the Baltic it is the Baltic Sea. Thank you. Well, uh, up to and including a, a blockade to keep out the food and fuel, up to and including uh, some sort of military intervention, uh, particularly by Poland, because uh, Poland has <laughs> really gotten hysterical of, of late. It's really feeling its oats, and uh, it's no secret, as has been rep- reported repeatedly in the media, that even with regard to his so-called ally, that is Ukraine, uh, Polish elite circles are now plotting on retaking territory from Ukraine that it feels should be under the jurisdiction of Warsaw. And so it takes no great uh, predictive uh, value or ability to suggest that if they're going to go after their ally, Ukraine, they'll certainly go after their antagonist, which is Russia. I, I don't. I'll put it like that. That'd be war. They go after Kaliningrad is heavily defended, but that would be an absolute war. That would be war. I think. Well, I think not it, only would that be war, but when I look at uh, Kaliningrad, and I don't know if Latvia and Lithuania want to be in the middle you know, as the Russian army. Yeah, that talks. would be that would be that would be war. I think at, the Russia would declare war on them. as they say. <laughs> I don't want none of that smoke. Uh, that would that would go bad, real bad, real quick. We did also want to ask you about the Indo-Pacific economic framework that the U.S. that the Biden administration are allegedly trying to put together. Well, what's interesting about that is that it's too little, too late. It's too late because if you look at the regional comprehensive economic partnership led by the People's Republic of China. It's certainly more comprehensive and incorporates more nations than the weak T that is this so-called Indo-Pacific economic framework enunciated by Mr. Biden a few days ago during his trip to Northeast Asia. And then if you look at RIC, Russia, Iran, China, they're all beginning to trade between and amongst themselves using their currencies, moving away from the dollar. And what's interesting there is that Washington or the United States is trying to, in some ways, shield their alleged allies, Malaysia, Philippines, et cetera, from penetrating the U.S. market where China is opening the door and asking and requesting that uh, Malaysia, Philippines, of course, have access uh, to the Chinese market. And I think the ultimate tell, as they say, T-E-L-L, is that the United States, according to press reports, it's in the midst of removing tariffs against Chinese products that were slapped on during the so-called trade war enunciated by the 45th U.S. president because it's felt that removing these tariffs will help to curb U.S. inflation. And so if the United States, as is apparently the case, is trying to reduce tensions with China, opening its market to Chinese products as it shows, shuts the door to products from its so-called allies in Malaysia and the Philippines. I think that that tells you all that you need to know. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you. Folks, you're listening to the...